yesterday Dave talked about evidence from design. And today, what we're going to look at a little more specifically is evidence from biology. And we'll look at some of the evidences that Darwin put forth or that his followers since then have been advancing as evidence of evolution. And we're going to show how creation model as, as depicted in Genesis uh, has good alternative view that we believe fits the facts even better than the evolutionary one. Now, I remind you yesterday, uh, both Dave and I believed in evolution. We were trained in evolutionary science. Uh, my degree was in biology and Dave's in, in math and geology. And uh, we both were trained and believed in evolution. But when we started to study the evidence for ourselves, we found there were a lot of problems with the evolution model. Then we went back and we looked at the Bible and we went, how in the world did we ever think the Bible could teach evolution? Because we ended up doing what so many people did at that point, which was say, well, maybe God used evolution so we could have what we thought was science and what we thought was, was biblical teaching and put the two together. But we found there were many problems with that idea. Yesterday, we talked about Genesis 1 through 11. And again, I just want to review this because I believe that if you have a really strong understanding of Genesis 1 through 11, it gives a tremendous foundation for, uh, for biblical creation and also gives a strong foundation for understanding science. And so Genesis 1 and 2 refer to creation or design. And as, as we look at it, at the end of that time, everything was very good. But then in Genesis 3 to 5, we see evidence that something happened to that very good earth, and it no longer is very good. And what, what happened was Adam and Eve, who had been placed on this earth to have dominion over the earth, to dress it, to keep it, to take care of this earth, not to, not to uh, rape the earth, as I had somebody tell me one time, but to take care of this earth as God's agents here on the earth. And when Adam and Eve uh, rebelled against God and sinned, they basically turned the, the, uh, that job over to the enemy at that point in time, Satan. Well, we see then that as we continue in Genesis, wickedness continued to increase until God brought the judgment of the flood. And that was, that was to cleanse the earth. It was to save Noah and his family and, and representatives of all the, all the animals, the land animals. And so we see evidence of the flood, and Dave will be talking about that in the next day or two. And then after that, we see Genesis 9 through 11, and we, we learn about Babel and the dispersion after the time of Babel. So that's kind of the pattern of, of where we're heading with this, um, with this program that we have today. So yesterday was creation design. Today, we're going to look at the idea of the fall and death and how did bad things come into this world. Because we find with talking with students and so on, evolution is the number one reason they give for not responding to the gospel. But right up there, close second, is this whole idea of where did evil come from and why is there so much suffering in the world? And if there's a good God, how could he allow death? How could he allow disease and suffering and so on? We find those things answered or beginning of the answer at least in Genesis chapter three. And we see evidence of that fall as we look around the earth because we see when God talked to Adam and Eve after that and what did he say? There would be thorns and thistles and the earth which used to be very productive and easy to work now became very difficult and and resisted it and we see death entering into the world we're going to look at those evidences because i believe that as we look at the world around us what we see is the scientific evidence fits with what we see in genesis 3 to 5. and i just want to encourage you to if you haven't done it in a while to read just sit down in one, one reading and read Genesis 1 through 11, because I think it really makes things clear for us. Well, 
Yesterday, we talked about two different models of understanding the history of mankind. How did man get on the earth? What is man's job? You know, how, did he come from apes and other kinds of prehistoric creatures, or was he created in the image of God? We believe now that he was created, that mankind is created in the image of God. It says in Genesis 1, male and female, but uh, made in the image of God, not coming from some kind of ape-like creatures as evolution would teach. Most people think, actually a lot of people think, maybe most, that evolution is science, but creation is just a religious myth. That's what I was taught when I was in school and, uh, and ended up believing that kind of an idea, trying to take the Bible and science and put them together. And it sort of does that, but it starts from the wrong foundation because the assumption here is that evolution is science. And when people hear science, they think, oh, well, that means it's got to be true. And, you know, creation is just religious. Well, we're going to look at the evidence today. In reality, both of these ideas have a religious component to them, and both of them require faith because no one was there at the very beginning. You can't, you can't go back and put that in a test tube and test it scientifically. We don't have any scientific observers who were there. All we have is some circumstantial evidence, and the evidence, the data that's left, requires interpretation. Evolution requires faith. Now, when I say that, sometimes people go, oh, no, we believe in science. We, believe, we, we do things scientifically, objective, objectively. But when I look at that, I go, wait, evolution requires faith, but the God or the gods of evolution are time and chance and natural processes. Of course, if you believe in creation, it requires faith too. But the creation is a faith in an intelligent, wise, and good God who, who created all things in the beginning. And so both of these are faith statements. Evolution is a belief system posing as science, and it is one of the main pillars or the foundational beliefs of the, of the worldview called naturalism, which says basically that everything can be explained by natural physical processes, that it didn't require supernatural for, for the beginning of life and so on. As creationists, we reject that view of naturalism, but that doesn't mean that we don't study the natural world. We do study the natural world as creationists who are scientists. We, we study the, the world as it is, and we are able through this, those studies to come up with uh, basic understandings of how this physical world works. But that those scientific uh, observations we make, we believe that points to the fact it couldn't have started by naturalism. It had to have a supernatural creator in the beginning. So as you look at the evidence, the question becomes, what, what is your worldview? What are you filtering the evidence through? Um, you know, what, what color is your filter? Because your worldview can affect your interpretation of the data. And the struggle between evolution and creation is really not a struggle over the data, but an interpretation of that data. Students in the schools and on the media and in uh, museums and national parks and so on, they're normally given an interpretation of data along with the data. They may be given you know, some data, but it's usually an interpretation of that data. And what we want students to do is to learn to ask, what's the evidence? Is this is this really a, a piece of data or is this an interpretation? Is it an assumption or is it a fact? And so we want to teach students to be critical thinkers and to be able to evaluate the data that way. When you think about uh, the, this whole creation evolution debate that goes on, it really is a mystery when you, when you say, well, how can two good scientists look at the very same evidence and come up with differing explanations. One of those guys going, wow, isn't evolution wonderful? And the other says, what an awesome, powerful creator we have. You can look at the same evidence and interpret it differently. And that's why we say that the, the argument is not over the data itself, but over the interpretation. Well, we're going to look today at, at three categories, and then Dave will look at, um, tomorrow or the next day at fossils. But we're going to look today at the supposed evidences of evolution, which will include change, similarity, 
and junk. Now we're grouping them in this way simply to help um, kind of find a pattern to, to share this evidence with. The word evolution simply means change. So do we believe in evolution? Well, I think we all believe that things change. The question we need to look at is how much change and what kind of change are we talking about? Are we talking about the molecules to man kind of evolution, mega evolution that says molecules could eventually over time turn into human beings? And in fact, those, those molecules themselves, according to this idea, came from non-living molecules in the beginning. And so we're going from nothing to everything in the mega evolutionary scale. It's useful if somebody tells you they believe in evolution, it's useful to ask them, well, what, what do you mean by evolution? Define it for me. What, what are you talking about with evolution? Because they may be talking about this overall theory of as evolution, or they may be talking about macro evolution, which is, is really changing from one type of thing to another type of thing. So fish to philosophers given enough time, right, as you can introduce changes. Or are they talking about simply variation within a created kind? So you could have frogs, a variety of frogs are still frogs. Variety of dogs, they're still dogs. And uh, is, is this really what we're seeing? Is this evolution in action? We're gonna be looking at some of Darwin's um, ideas about the finches and then some other different types uh, of evidence that are used to show what they say is evolution in action. Is it really? What about these finches? Well, it's not the type of evolution that can prove how you can go from goo to you by way of the zoo. What we see with Darwin's famous finches is variation within beak sizes and some other shapes of the body and so on. But what we don't see is that is that uh whoops that we have let me hang on a second here what we what we see is variation yes but evolution no as in the dogs let me just uh, skip over these quickly in the dog type we have wolves and we have domestic dogs but they're saying they're the same basic kind of creature and we can have interbreeding which means that what we see here is we believe these were of the same created kind back in genesis so variation yes but evolution no now let's look at the finches i got ahead of myself a bit back there finches are they really evidence of evolution or are the evidence of these changes within a created kind? Well, you can ask the question, what do you start with? You, know, you start with finches, what do you end up with? Finches, so you have nothing fundamentally new. They're still finches. You see some minor variations, yes. And it's interesting, the latest research on these finches is showing that these variations seem to follow changes in the environmental conditions to some extent. So over periods of long, you know, several years, dry years and so on, you might have changes that come in to adapt to eating the harder seeds and so on. And then late, if there's more rain, maybe their diet changes somewhat. People have asked, are these changes due to epigenetics? Epigenetics is a, a field of study right now in genetics. It's, um, it's been around for a while, but it's coming to the forefront these days. Epigenetics is the idea that there's something on top of or, or in addition to the genes that control the various traits. So this is a quote from Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins uh, in 2019 Answers Magazine. He says, scientists have discovered, <laughs> hold on, that the genes are very similar among the various species. They discovered that epigenetics correlated closely with beak shape, and sizes among species. Epigenetic mechanisms clearly remain a major player in adaptation. I was excited to start learning about epigenetics because I had always had the question, we, you have the, you have the uh, DNA code, which is like a language system, and yet there's something that is able to interact with the environment within that code. And I always wondered, what, what is that? Because something comes in and, and and influences the way that the genes are expressed, whether they're turned on, whether they're turned off, and, and how are they expressed. And I believe that what we 
we can see from epigenetics is a partial answer to that, that people are starting to look at this idea of, of factors that can change the way in which an organism interacts with its environment. And it's fascinating. And people will say, well, see, isn't that evolution? I'm going, no way, no way. It just complicates the whole genetic thing even further than it was before. It just makes it a whole lot more complex and more pointing to design. What about peppered moss? Are they good evidence of evolution? You're usually told that. That's in the classic evidences put in the textbooks. And the idea was these little moss were around in Great Britain before the Industrial Revolution. And at that point in time, the air was clean and the tree bark was light colored. And then, you know, they started burning nasty old coal, as they would say, and polluted the air. And over time, they say, there's more dark moss than light ones. Well, my question is, what did you start out with? You start out with moths. And what do you end up with? Moths, light ones and dark ones. And you started with light ones and dark ones. So you have nothing fundamentally new, which you, according to this idea, what you do have is a variation in relative percentages of the light and the dark moss. However, there's a problem here and that when, they, when they've gone back and looked at this research, it can't be duplicated. They find that these moths do not normally even rest on the bark of the trees, on the trunks. They, they're nocturnal and so they fly at night and during the day they hide up in the leaves and the foliage of the trees. And, and so the, the uh, pictures that you see in the textbooks and so on, they had to stick the moths on the tree to get those pictures. And so I'm going, well, is this even a uh, is this even a valid at all idea these the whole idea of the peppered moths back in 2002 jonathan wells exposed this peppered moth icon he called it in the icons of evolution book and it, that was confirmed later on in 2012 uh, in evolution news and views journal of evolutionary biology and we see that that uh these pep there, there's problems with the peppered moth theory so they don't prove evolution what about antibiotic resistant bacteria and viruses and ddt resistant bugs and so on are they evidence of evolution i mean we can see evolution taking place almost right before our eyes as we talk about uh, in the in the latest pandemic and so on and talk the the talk is this virus is mutating so rapidly that it, it's able to continue to adapt and adapt and escape from, from treatment and so on. Well, is, is that evolution? Not really, because what do we start with? We start with bacteria or virus in the case we were talking about. And what do we end up with? We end up with bacteria or virus, nothing fundamentally new. They're all this, pretty much the same and, and the bacteria are the same basic types of bacteria. And so when we, when we would need a, what we would need for evidence of evolution is how do we get new genetic information? This, this doesn't show that. And it's supposed, and we'll look at it in a bit, that that, that variation comes from mutation and natural selection. Let's, we'll see how that plays into this in a minute or two. So what we do see when we look at some of these classic evidences of evolution is we do see variation, yes. Variation, we would say as creationists within a created kind, but then we say evolution. No, this is not evolution at all. It's not, it's not changing from one kind of a thing to another kind of a thing. If anything, it would be that microevolution, just the little variable changes within a kind, not from one kind to another. What about the races? Was Darwin wrong about the races? He thought that uh, in his in his book on uh, the uh, <laughs> on human evolution, which just escaped me the title, but I'll think of it later. Um, he he talked about the origin of the races, and he thought there were five different different types of apes and monkeys that had evolved into the five different types of races that we see on the earth today. Well, is that true or isn't that true? You know, we can show looking at something that's called a Punnett square, which is typically used in genetics classes, you can show that if you start with parents with medium skin color with a, a heterozygous condition, that means that they have 
um, dominant and recessive genes like you see um, represented here on the screen, you can get all the way from darkest dark to lightest light skin color in one generation. It doesn't take thousands and thousands of years. Now, is that really happening? Yes, it is. There are, there are examples with families, medium skin color parents, and they have twin little girls, one very dark, one very light. Another set of twins here, one is white, one is dark. And so it can happen quickly within one family. Now we also can see here how Africans involved a palette of skin tones. This was an article from Science in 2017. And these show uh, within this article, it says researchers agree that our early Australopithecine ancestors in Africa probably had light skin beneath hairy pelts. Well, I don't know how in the world they figured that out in the first place. But then they said this, Tishkoff's team found that, found that the story of skin color evolution isn't so black and white. The study adds to established research undercutting old notions of race. You can't use skin color to classify humans, he says. There is so much diversity in Africans that there is no such thing as an African race. Well, that's interesting to know, isn't it? We'll talk more about uh, the races and so on. We believe that the races came after the time of, of Babel. We don't really even believe there were different races. I'm just using that for communication. But after Babel, as the people spread out around the earth, that those various skin colors could be cemented into the population. Well, here's a question. According to evolution, how do you get new genetic information? Where does it come from? Darwin didn't know. He, he had an idea of Lamarckianism, which was the inheritance of acquired traits, plus his idea that made him famous was this idea of natural selection or survival of the fittest. Well, this idea of acquired traits has been pretty well, uh, pretty well gotten rid of these days, except now, as we start looking at epigenetics, we were wondering, well, how much can we change by way of epigenetics? And how much of that is saved by, by uh, natural selection? Here's another quote from Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins. He says, everywhere they look, researchers are finding new examples of epigenetic modifications that add or remove special chemical tags in an organism's DNA structure without altering the genetic code. What's even more incredible is that these alterations can be inherited over multiple generations. So today, we don't really think too much about, about um, Today, we don't think too much about Lamarckianism, although this idea of epigenetics is coming in. But the, the classical kind of neo-Darwinian evolution proposes that the changes come about by mutation plus natural selection. So let's take a look about that. Mutations are just simply changes in the genetic structure. And, and uh, the problem is neither mutations nor natural selection are creative. They can only operate on things that are already in existence. So for example, if you, if you wanna have a mutation to the, to the genes, you have to have the genes to start with. They don't create genes, they just change them. And, and the other thing is with natural selection, you can't create anything either. It can only select of what's already there. So it's not a creative mechanism in the first place. But the question would be then, what do the actual, actual observation, what do mutations produce? And we find they produce things like two-headed snakes and cattle with extra legs and roosters without any feathers and all sorts of fruit flies, curly wings, different shapes and sizes on their bodies, four wings in this one and so on. And so there are all kinds of differing um, uh, variations within fruit flies, but they're still fruit flies. Well, what are the obser observed results of mutation? Now, this is the actual science. This is what we observe, which if you remember right, science is all about observation and experimentation. And boy, there's been a lot of experimentation in the genetics labs to find out what can we do. 
Well, one of the things that happens with mutations is it results in duplication of information. So example, you had four winged flies instead of two. It can result also in loss of information um, or deregulation of genetic information like occurs in cancer cells or aging and death. And so mutations do not look like something that can produce anything good. What we see instead is that mutations are harmful. Dr. John Sanford uh, is a geneticist. He used to be at Cornell um, University, a Cornell University professor. He, did, he was a genetic researcher. He was a co-inventor of the gene gun process by which you can, you can look at the DNA. Well, being a geneticist of that level, he is wanting to look at the actual evidence. And what he came up with was the idea, well, when you ask people about Darwinian evolution, they will tell you evolution proceeds by mutation and natural selection. But Dr. Sanford scientifically through the evidence showed, demonstrated that doesn't work. His book, Genetic Entropy, um, is, is quite in depth looking at this research. Here's a couple quotes from Sanford. He says, mutational entropy appears to be so strong, especially within large genomes, that selection should not be able to reverse it. And uh, <laughs> he goes on, it's now clear that mutation and selection cannot stop the loss of genomic information. So mutation and selection clearly could not create the genome. Careful analysis on many levels consistently reveals that the primary axiom is absolutely wrong. What was that primary axiom? Is the idea that evolution proceeds by mutation plus natural selection. He says the evidence says that's wrong. He says it's now clear that mutation and selection cannot even stop the loss of genomic information. So they couldn't clearly could not create it in the first place. And then I love what he says here. If mutation and selection can't prevent the degeneration of the genome, then the primary axiom is wrong. Look at these, these words he uses. It's not just implausible. It's not just unlikely. It's absolutely dead wrong. It's not just a false axiom. It's an unsupported and discredited hypothesis which can be confidently rejected. So looking at mechanisms for evolution, we can just say no. Mutation and natural selection cannot explain the origin of new kinds of living things. They do take place. They're real processes. Mutation does take place. There are, there are changes in the genetic structure and natural selection does weed things out. But what they, what they do is maintain some level of fitness. They do, not, they do not create anything new that's going to be better. So the big question then becomes, well, where do you get life in the first place then? If you have to have something to work on and uh, where did that life come from in the first place? Well, this whole idea of origin of life you either have evolutionary speculation, which pre pre just assumes that life has come into existence from non-living molecules over many millions of years. And that idea we say is speculation. The reason we say speculation is nobody's ever observed it. it, it it's just speculation. Where the scientific observation, the real observation says life comes only from life. That's one of the most primary forms of the primary levels of, of uh, laws in biology that you learn. One of the very first things you learn in biology, life comes only from pre-existing life. So then the question becomes, well, where did that pre-existing life come from? And it leads you back to the origin of life. Scripture tells us that God himself is the origin of life on this planet. Now you could have another question that says then where did God come from? And we can't prove that scientifically. There's no evidence to say that, that uh, God is eternal, but the word of God says he's eternal and that's what makes sense. And so you come down to a place, you either have faith that molecules can turn into human beings with no guidance at all from the supernatural, that it just happens over time and chance, or that there's a supernatural creator. And so either one requires faith. I choose to believe in the God that created and the evidence seems to follow that way. 
Uh, Franklin M. Harold said this, we must concede that there are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical or cellular system, only a variety of wishful speculations. Well, wishful speculations are not exactly science. I mean, science again, based on what? Observation and experimentation, not speculations. Now, you might speculate, you might put out a hypothesis, which is an educated guess, but then the process of science is to go and try to test that hypothesis to find out if it holds up against the real world evidence we see, because we live in a physical world and there is evidence out there, there is data. Well, as Franklin Harold um, goes on to say, we should reject as a matter of principles, the substitution of intelligent design for the dialogue of chance and necessity. Remember, he just said it was all wishful speculations. And now he's saying, don't don't try to call in intelligent design as an answer, because we, we got to reject that as a matter of principle. In other words, it's already in their mind, in their worldview system, not an option. So we can't even consider it in science. And that's what really happens. So when we look at this uh, supposed evidences of evolution change, yes, things do change but is it the kind of change you would need for evolution and and uh when we look at the change uh, is there evidence of that kind of change and i would say no there isn't now we could do a lot more in that area but time is limited so we're going to go on to the next one which is a supposed evidence of evolution of similarity this is the idea that because things are similar that indicates a common ancestry a lot of times that is scientifically, they called that homology or the study of similarities. And they show how a man's arm and a dog's uh, leg and a bird's wing and a whale's flipper are all basically similar in their basic design structure. And they'll say, see, this means they came from common ancestry. I look at that and I go, wait a minute, there are other reasons why things might be similar maybe they were designed for a similar function so what we're seeing instead of common ancestry is variation on a theme a common designer maybe it shows they were designed by the same designer we have one god one creator not a pantheon of gods and so this would be like if you could go into the art museum and pick out the the pieces that were done by rembrandt say because you recognize the themes and the use of color and so on shows us that commonality. So maybe that's why we see similarity in nature. Also, another positive reason why things are, are similar in many ways is they were designed to work together. So they live in the same ecosystem. We have the same universe. We have the same kinds of chemicals in human beings as we find in animals, with, as we find really in in inanimate objects also and so we we live within constraints there are constraints on our physical life system and and they're they're designed to work together so you would expect to find similarities in the various types of animals and, and even plants that would would be things that we as human beings could could uh, identify with or use i think that that's a really good possibility also why we see similarity. Now, sometimes you'll see pictures like this, the little baby embryo at two months in development inside its mother, and it has gill slits and yolk sac and tail, they say. Well, first of all, we look at those, we look at those um, titles they give them, and we need to ask a few more questions. Are they really gills? No, they're not gills. Are they slits? No, they're little pouches in human being. So why would they call them gill slits, except they're trying to remind us of our fish origins, that we are related to fish. Same thing with the yolk sac. Humans don't need yolk, but we have this little sac that produces blood for the baby until it's big enough to produce the blood and the bones and so on. And what about the tail? Looks like a tail, doesn't it? But it's not, it just, it's the end of the spinal column. It grows a little more quickly here at this stage. And as it does, it stimulates the growth of that 
of that little baby inside of the mother. So these things are just, you can see, even by the way they're labeled, that there is a bias that's built in to the labeling system itself. And so students, beware. Ask some questions when you see these kinds of things. The biogenetic law was this, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That's a big mouthful. But what it really means is that the development of the individual goes back over the development of the species or the type. So in other words, on a simple level, the baby human would go through the stages of evolution as it develops inside of the mother. And then Ernst Haeckel was a, a strong supporter of Darwin. Um, he, he promoted this idea a lot, but it was all shown to be fraudulent. Embryologists today can tell the difference of these various types of cre uh, creatures very early on in development. And of course, now with our understanding of, of DNA, we can, we can show it even more clearly. But uh, so this idea has really been debunked. And yet you still see pictures like that coming up in magazines and books and so on. Today, when they look at, bio, at uh, similarities, they're looking a lot at biochemical similarities or biochemical homology, studying things like DNA, the order of the nucleotides in the DNA, RNA, and the order there, and the proteins, the order of amino acids, and so on. And again, what they're looking for is similarities and when they find those similarities, they think that they're able to put them into a tree of life or to show what kinds of animals are closest to humans in the evolutionary uh, scheme of things. Well, that's where you get in popular magazines, things like this. Uh, chimps and humans share almost 99% of their DNA, how we became human, it says. Well, as we look at that, People look at these things and they think, really, 99% the same? We must be related to apes, chimps, and, and other kinds of creatures then. But is that really true? That 99% is going down with further research. Uh, it's, it's gone down to 93.6% in some studies and then down to 86% in other studies. Jeffrey Tompkins says maybe as low as 70 to 71%. And so that the, first of all, when you study these things, the similarity is not as great as they make you think it is. But secondly, even if it was similar, so what? You know, does that mean that we came from these creatures or are, or are one of those other ideas that we talked about earlier about the reasons for similarity uh, more important? If you want to get into a little more detail, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen put out a book in 2018. It's called Replacing Darwin, the, the New Origin of Species. It's a little technical. You need some biology background to understand it, but excellent, excellent book. But even if we do see similarity, so what? The mouse is supposedly 97.5% similar to humans. Zebra fish, 92% similar to humans. And I love this one, bananas, 50% similar to humans, according to th this, I think, came from a museum someplace that we went to. So, you know, you look at similarity, it really doesn't prove evolution at all. Michael Denton looked at this idea way back in 1985 when he wrote this book, Evolution, A Theory and Crisis. It's kind of a classic now. Denton is a molecular biologist. He, is, he was not a creationist when he wrote that book. I think he's an intelligent design proponent these days, but he's not a creationist in the classical sense, I don't believe. But he wrote back then, um, the really significant finding that comes to light comparing amino acid sequences uh, is that it is impossible to arrange them in any sort of evolutionary series. He, th he saw that back in 1985 as, as he was looking into this idea of similarities of the molecules producing, you know, that we could see in evolutionary series. Then bi biologist Michael Lynch wrote this in 1999, clarification of the phylogenetic relationships. Phylogenetic, it's a roughly equivalent to, we could say, evolution. So clarification of the evolutionary relationships 
of the major animal phyla has been an elusive problem, he calls it, with the analysis based on different genes. And get this, even different analyses based on the same genes yielding a diversity of phylogenetic trees. So even when you look at the same genes, they can be interpreted in a way such that you don't come up with one evolutionary tree. That evolutionary tree has, has you know, permeated museums and textbooks and so on, and the common popular media and so on for, for decades. And yet, was Darwin wrong? You know, new scientists came out with this article on, on uh, the evolutionary tree of life, and they got some they got some feedback from their readers saying, you're doing junk science and, you know, cancel my subscription and on and on. They got a lot of static for this article. But what they were trying to show in this article was it's not a clear cut case for evolution. Uh, in that article, they included Darwin's sketch of an evolutionary tree of life that he Darwin had just sketched it out in his journal. Look what he says up in the corner. I think I think. That's what he, it's just, a, it's just a, a theory he had at that point, an idea he had at that point, and yet it has become universal, really. The article goes on and says, for a long time, the holy grail was to build a tree of life. A few years ago, it looked as though that grail was within reach, but today the project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. The tree of life, one of the iconic concepts of evolution, has turned out to be a figment of our imagination. Wait a minute, imagination? I thought science was based, again, on observation and experimentation. Yes, you can, you can have an imagination involved in a hypothesis, but then you go on to try to demonstrate the truth of that hypothesis. You don't just hold it out there and say, well, it's true because I can think of, I can guess something. New Scientist goes on, this article says, we have no evidence at all that the tree of life is a reality. And then I love this, they go, biology is vastly more complex than we thought. And facing up to this complexity will be scary. Well, I don't find it scary as a creationist because the more that we learn in genetics, the more it points to the complexity of life that could not happen by accidents and chance, and that it points more to an intelligent designer, at least in my thinking. And so we're not scared of true scientific research, and we shouldn't be. Real scientific research, I believe, is always going to point to a creator. It will, because that, that creator is, is true. And uh, that's my bias. That's a faith statement, I know. But but evolution itself, if you if you hold on to evolution, just like he said here, it's vastly more complex than we thought. And and what was really the complexity that he was referring to in this article is the DNA studies that are going on and seeing the complexity of DNA. So when it comes to trying to construct a tree of life, we can see that it's coming apart. It's being chopped down by science itself. And what we actually see is not the tree of life, but we see the endpoints of those things. We see human beings, we see horses, we see frogs, fish, so on. We see the endpoints, but not the commonality that is connecting all of these things together. At least it's not in the actual evidence that we see. So supposed evidence has changed. We looked at it, we looked at similarity. Let's look at this third one, which is junk. And what do we mean by junk? Well, we mean leftovers from evolution or what used to be called vestigial organs, useless leftovers. They had a list of 180 different useless leftovers at one time, including pituitary gland and thymus and tonsil, appendix, wisdom teeth, and a whole bunch more. As a creationist, when I look at this, I would go, wait a minute, I don't believe it's a useless leftover from evolution. I believe it has a purpose because God is the creator and God has a purpose for what he does. He doesn't just willy-nilly let things happen. And so 
we can look at, and, and the idea would be as a creationist, you'd say, go back into the lab, do more research, study it again, and let's see what these things do. Well, that's been done over time. The pituitary gland, which they thought was just a useless leftover, now we know it's used in regulation. It's one of the most important glands in the body. And they, they sometimes call it the master gland of the body. Thymus and tonsils and even the appendix are now known to be used for immunity. And the wisdom teeth, well, they're for chewing, just like all the rest of our teeth, aren't they? Now it's true, sometimes, sometimes in development, the jaw doesn't develop big enough and, and those teeth become impacted and have to be removed. But just because something can go wrong doesn't mean it wasn't created in the first place. I mean, something can go wrong with your heart too, but it doesn't mean it's a useless leftover that's not needed today. Or just because something else can take over and take its place doesn't mean it's not needed today. You for you know you could live without a hand, but you don't want to. I mean that doesn't mean it had no purpose in the first place. And so we look at these things. Yes, something could go wrong with them over time, but to say that they are useless leftovers with no function is really not uh, accurate according to the knowledge of science. What about junk DNA? I mean, years ago, they came out with this, this statement that said 97 or 98% of our DNA is junk. It's not useful in producing proteins. It's not used. And so they called it junk, leftover, vestigial from years and years of evolution. And they just thought that that was what was in there. As creationists, again, we said, no, go back to the lab, do the research. And we said we predict it's not junk. We predict that if you go back to the lab, you're going to find that these sections of DNA have a purpose, that they are functional. And sure enough, as the as the science has been progressing and as people have been doing the research, uh, Dr. Sanford says it's becoming increasingly clear that most or all of the genome is functional. It has a function. It's not just leftover, uh, useless leftovers from evolution. There was a multinational uh, research project called the ENCODE project. It was done about 10 years ago. And they came back with um, what they called an integrated encyclopedia of DNA elements in the human genome in this article in Nature Magazine, September 6, 2012. And as you look at, as you look at this project, the end result of this was almost every nucleotide is associated with a function. Now that's, they're talking about the ones they studied obviously in this project, but they're saying that there's, there is a function. It's not just the useless leftover. They said uh, Discover Magazine published a blog later on saying this metaphor of junk isn't that useful. <laughs> well, we didn't think it was that useful in the first place, but it, it has spurred some research, which is good. Discover Magazine says the key point is it's not junk. And I would agree with that. It's not junk. Look at some of the uses for these non-protein coding segments of the DNA. Uh, it's used to repairing DNA, assisting in DNA regulation, replication, regulating DNA transcription, aiding in folding of chromosomes, aiding in the maintenance of chromosomes, controlling RNA, editing and splicing, helping to fight disease, regulating embryological development. And that's just a few of the different functions that they have found for the segments of DNA, just a few of them. And that last one, regulating embryological development, if that didn't work, we wouldn't even be around. You wouldn't have reproduction in the first place and we wouldn't even be here. And so we look at these these sections of DNA that were called junk DNA, we say, no, there is a function. And there's just been tons of articles coming out talking about these, these sections, these types of uh, parts of the DNA. In uh, 2021, April 12th, uh, article again by, by Jeffrey Tompkins. Jeffrey Tompkins, by the way, is on staff with the Institute for Creation Research as a genetic researcher. He does tremendous work. I highly recommend you can, you know, get on and read some of his stuff. But he says human genome, the 20th anniversary of when they, they deciphered the, the human genome. He says junk DNA hits the trash. And that's right. It's, it's just not a functional idea anymore. 
So we can look at DNA and we can say, no junk, it looks like it's designed. So as we looked at these supposed evidences of evolution, we looked at things like change and similarity and junk, and next time we'll look at fossils, but we can just say no to these aspects of biology, these, these various things within biology. And if you combine that with Dave's talk from yesterday on evidences of design, I think it's very powerful. The evidence, the actual scientific evidence points to a creator and not to evolution by random chance mutations and natural selection. And as I said at the beginning, I used to believe in that evolutionary model because that's all I was taught in school. And I thought it would work. It seemed to make sense in my brain. But when you get down to the details and you start looking at it, it does not make sense. And the evidence itself does not support macro or mega evolution. If anything, just that little bit of variation within a change, but or within a kind, but even that, you had to have something to start with. You can't just generate it out of nothing. So was Darwin wrong about biology? I don't have to say, you know, Darwin, he was right about some things, but he was very wrong about other things. He knew nothing really about genetics. Mendel's work on genetics didn't come out until just a few years after Darwin's book. I've, I've often wondered if that if this uh, Mendel's work had been available to Darwin, would it have altered the way he looked at things? Would he still have gone to mutation and natural selection? Because what we see when we study traditional genetics, Mendelian genetics, is that you can get all kinds of variation within creatures simply based on the way that the genes are shuffled during reproduction. And so maybe Darwin wouldn't have ended up believing in evolution. We really don't know. He didn't know anything. Darwin didn't know anything about a human cell. He thought it was just a little bag of protoplasm and he didn't realize the complexity inside of every cell and the microorganelles, the mitochondria and the nucleus and the, all the different parts of the cell. He didn't have any idea of that kind of thing. It wasn't available to him. He didn't know what DNA was. He didn't know the relationship of DNA and proteins takes DNA to make proteins and it takes proteins to make DNA. So you come back to the classic chicken and the egg question, which came first. I think God created both of them at the same time. He created these systems that would work. This whole system of DNA being the code and being then transcribed and being you that being the code that codes for making proteins and tells your body how to make the proteins you need but it's true there are proteins needed along that whole process to produce and replicate the dna and so it's it's one of those things that yes they had to come together it didn't work one at a time so what if darwin had known about all this would he have changed his mind i don't know you know because Evolution is not only an intellectual argument. For many people, evolution is a matter of the heart. And some people believe in evolution because that's all they've ever been taught. I think there's a lot of people believe that. They believe it's scientific. But other times people reject creation and, and adopt the evolutionary model because they don't want there to be a creator. They don't want to be accountable to a creator. They want to be independent and they think if they've just evolved that they are in a way a god to themselves we don't know we don't know what it was with darwin for sure um, there's some indication that he became bitter about god um, because i think it was his daughter that died because in, in darwin you know blamed god i don't know if that's true or not we don't know if he would have if this evidence would have led him to believe but we feel like that evidence needs to be put out there because for students like Jeff that we talked about yesterday, it, his hesitancy to come to the Lord was based on the fact that he thought evolution was proven science. Once he was able to see the scientific evidence and to see that it didn't lead to evolution, he was able then to come back to the Bible and to, to read scripture and to eventually to believe what it had to say about Jesus Christ coming as a sacrifice for our sins and and um, jeff was able to come to know jesus that way so we don't know about darwin we don't know what would have happened if he would have had that 
evidence he didn't. And today we see so many people don't have it, which is why AOI exists to give answers to these evolutionary ideas, to, to demonstrate the truth of scripture, to bring that truth of scripture to people all over, people of all ages, all over, wherever they're willing to listen. And we see that the evidence makes a big difference, but also that relationship. And so as we look at the evidence of change, similarity, and junk, uh, we say no to evolution next week or the week after, or not next week, tomorrow, I think it is, Dave's gonna talk about fossils. And you'll see from the fossils too, they don't prove evolution either. They're not part of the evidence of evolution. And so we'll be getting to that 